Welcome to Saturday Story Circle, always on the Mutual Audio Network. The following audio drama is rated G for general audience. Sorry, we've just closed. Oh, very well. Hello, how can I help you? Hello, young lady. Is this Aurora's apothecary shop? Yes, it is. Just like the sign says. See? Aurora's apothecary shop. Oh, very good. And are you Aurora? Yes. I am Aurora, and this is my apothecary shop. Would you like to come in and sit down? Thank you, yes. I'd be glad to have a rest inside. Ah, it's good to sit down. I have been looking for you for a long time, ever since I got back from my travels. Really? I only opened the shop a few years ago. Not the shop. I've been looking for you, Aurora. I'm so glad I finally found you. At my age, you never know how much time you have left. I need your help. Why have you been looking for me? Oh, remember when I was little? I used to be able to go all day. Now, I get tired just walking across the room. Hmm? You said you've been looking for me for years and you need my help. Why? Who are you? Oh, I'm your daughter, and I want to share a most precious treasure. My daughter? A treasure? Yes, one I need to share with you. With me? Oh, my... Maybe you're too tired to hear this right now. You keep repeating what I just said as a question. A question? Uh, Sorry, this is hard to take in. You're my daughter, but you're, well, forgive me, but you're an old woman. Yes, my story is complicated, but it will all make sense. Trust me, mummy. Mummy? There you go again. Why don't you come visit me tomorrow, when you've had some time to think? I just moved into the Hundred Acre Rest Home. You know where that is? The Hundred Acre Rest Home? I mean, yes, I do. It's over by Pooh Corner. That's right. Come to see me tomorrow morning, before you open the store. I'm an early riser. I can prove that I am who I say. And I can show you a very special treasure. Tomorrow morning? Yes, I'll be there. Thank you, um, daughter. I look forward to chatting with you. My name is Dawn. See you tomorrow, mummy. Welcome to the Fairy Tale Mysteries Radio Show, classic tales told in a whole new way, featuring Detective Betsy Hardup, the toughest private eye in Fairy Tale City. When Fairy Tale and nursery rhyme characters can't take their problems to the police, they come to her. There is a fog rolling in on the city. You feel a shiver of danger blowing on the breeze, and the stories that it tells aren't pretty. They're gritty, no pity but witty. They're the fairy tale mysteries. Betsy has been busy battling the mob. In her last adventure, she discovered that the local mob was led by none other than her own fairy godmother. As the old saying goes, Absolute power corrupts absolutely, and Betsy's fairy godmother had absolutely gone bad. 
Although Betsy and her friends had nabbed aspiring mobster Papa Bear, the godmother had given them the slip. Will Betsy get another chance to bring the godmother down? Find out in this episode, A Rude Awakening Part 1. I was sitting in my office with a cup of java, watching the sun come up and wrestling with the crossword in the paper. I was almost finished. Just as I was reading 15 down, my door burst open and my friend Aurora came in. Looking flustered. Hello, Betsy. Are you busy? Nope. Especially if you know a six-letter word for witch's brew. Huh? Oh, try potion. That fits. Thanks, pal. Now, what can I do for you? I have to go make a visit somewhere, and I'd like you to come with me. Sure, sure. You need protection or just moral support? Maybe both? I don't know. It's all very strange. Why don't you sit down and tell me what's going on? I'll put some coffee on the hot plate. Who are you going to visit? My daughter, Dawn. Jumpin', Jack be nimble. You have a daughter? How old is she? Close to a hundred, I should think. What? I had her when I was very young. At least, I'm pretty sure I did. If this is her. At the risk of repeating myself. What? Everybody knows the story about how I was cursed as a child and doomed to prick my finger on a spinning wheel spindle and fall asleep, right? Well, what they don't know is that my parents tried to stop the curse by marrying me off when I turned 16. An arranged marriage? Exactly! I was betrothed to a prince from a far-off land. The plan was that he would take me away and I could escape the curse. Before I could leave, I accidentally pricked my finger and fell asleep. Turns out those curses are hard to avoid. When I was awakened by a kiss, I thought I'd only just dropped off, but it turned out to be a hundred years later. And the prince who kissed me wasn't from a far-off land. That was Philip, right? Your ex-husband? Here's your coffee. Right. Thanks. Ah, That hits the spot. Philip and I never had any kids, thank goodness. Although we tried when we first got together. Young love, you know what it's like. I remember. Well, before I found that spinning wheel, Prince Zane and I, well, we... uh, Um... You had a fling with the foreign prince and you might have been in the family way when you fell asleep? Exactly! I've often wondered if I had a child out there somewhere, but I had no way to find out. Everyone I knew before I fell asleep was long gone when I awoke. And now this old lady has come to me claiming to be my daughter? I need to know if she's telling the truth. You sound kind of skeptical. She asked me if I remembered when she was little. If she really was my daughter, she would know I couldn't remember any of that. I was asleep, and she mentioned a treasure that she wanted to share with me. It sounds like a setup. Won't you come with me to see her? You're a detective. You might spot something I'd miss. Something that could... Something that might prove whether her story checks out for real. I get it. I'd be glad to help out. Let me get my coat. Hundred was the right word for this rest home, as in a hundred years old. The place had huge cast iron gates hanging crookedly from a brick fence that surrounded the grounds. As we went through them, we could see the patients taking in the air, attended by staff. Rory was nursing a large thermos I'd seen her fill with some of that fancy Sun Moon and Talia brand coffee. Sometimes I thought she'd be healthier if she just slept a little bit more, but I knew better than to suggest it. Here, Mr. Johnson, let me pour you some nice lemonade. We headed to the front desk. Hello. Do you have business here today, Tiddly Palm? This isn't some public domain, you know. Yes, I was invited to visit my daughter, Dawn. Oh, bother. I'm afraid I have some bad news to tell you. Your mother passed away late last night. Oh, no. We only just met. And she was my daughter. I think you're becoming overwrought, Tiddly Palm. Take it easy there, Rory. Come sit down. I could ask Nurse Tigger to come cheer you up. He's very good at bouncing people. Nix on that, sister. But could we go see Dawn's place? Her room? Do you think that's a good idea? This poor lady is already in quite a tizzy, and that might upset her even more. No, I'm... I'll be all right. And I would like to see where she lived. I think it would help. Well, if you're sure, come along with me up the stairs. Watch the carpet just there. It can be quite tricky. 
The nurse let us into Dawn's room. It was a suite, really, with a kitchen area, a sitting room, and a bed at the far end, complete with a bedside table. The nurse helped Rory into the settee and then left. Look at those shelves. They are covered with picture albums. Why don't you go take a look through them? I'm going to go through her drawers. Uh, the drawers in her bedside table, I mean. You okay, Rory? Yes, it's just a bit of a shock. To suddenly find her and lose her just as suddenly. I still don't even know if she was really my daughter. Maybe we'll find some clues here. Oh, my stars. It looks like she's been all over the place. See? All the photos in this album were taken in Europe somewhere. Maybe Italy or Greece? She did say she had recently returned from her travels. Interesting. Who else is in the pics? Nobody, really. There are other people, but they're different in every photo, like they were just passers-by. The only thing in the bedside table is a leaflet on the Antipodes. What are those? It's an old name for Australia. This album has pictures of her trip there. Look. Oof, this thing is heavy like a Chevy. Oh, aren't those koalas cute as a bug's ear? Aren't they? There are a lot of albums here, but I can't find any pictures of... Ah, I feel like this is wrong, that she's a fake. Here, you look through these. Whoa, th that's a big stack. Whoops. Oh, no. Sorry, Rory. They slipped. I'll help you get them. Thank you, Betsy, but I think I have to leave. I just can't stay here right now. I'm sorry. Hey, no sweat, kiddo. This has got to be rough on you. You head to the store, maybe have a coffee or three. I'll clean up here and do some snooping around. Then drop by and fill you in later. I'll see if I can get to the bottom of this treasure business, too. Oh, thank you so much, Betsy. You're a good friend. Don't worry about that treasure. I don't think it's real. Hey, finding out stuff is what I do. So I'll find out, okay? You get out of here. I'll see you later. Yes, good idea. See you later. I felt bad for the poor kid. Must have been a rough trip on the old emotional roller coaster for her. I started picking up all the photo albums and arranging them on the shelf. As I reached for the last one, I accidentally kicked it under the bed. I knelt down and reached as far as I could to grab the edge of the album. As I dragged it towards me, I saw another, smaller book. I pulled it out. It seemed to be a well-worn day planner from this year. A quick look inside showed it to be full of plans that matched the albums. Sightseeing and traveling. I skipped ahead to the day's date. I could see the numbers 215 written there. I checked my watch. It wasn't even 9 a.m. yet. Who was she going to meet at 215? I kept flipping through the pages, and it was empty until the last page, where there was an address. 59 Briar Road. Maybe that's where she needed to be at 215. I tried to close the drawer on the bedside table, but it seemed stuck. I jiggled it and heard something fall to the floor. I picked up a small key. It looked very old-fashioned, not something you'd use in modern fairy tale city at all. I needed some answers, which meant I needed to ask some questions. And I knew just the person who might be able to help me understand all of this. I was sitting at a small table at Bibbidi Bobbidi Brew Cafe. Across from me was Aurora's ex-husband, Prince Philip. In some ways, he reminded me of Ivan. He came from similar stock, went to a similar school, hung out with similar people. I am usually very good at understanding things. I'm an understanding kind of guy, you know what I mean? <laughs> but that's where the similarities ended. I could see why Aurora left faster than I did. I had called him hoping he'd be able to shed some light on Aurora's history. So far, his bulb seemed a little too dim to illuminate anything. Look, do you know anything about Aurora having a daughter or not? No, we haven't had any kids. Too busy, what with the real estate firm and all. She did go on sometimes about looking for some child or something from ages ago, but, like, children can't be a hundred years old. Unless they were frozen in ice or made of wood. Why, then they'd be adults, right? <laughs> I guess not. Anyway, she hasn't spoken about it in a while. Not since she started working on her little hobby shop. You mean the apothecary? Right, that. I let her keep running it for now. I mean, she seems to enjoy it and everything. But once we get back together full time, I'm afraid I'll have to insist she shut it down. Shut it down? Or sell it off, I'm easy. 
The point is, she'll be much too busy to run a shop. Really? Because... Because she'll be busy with me. It's like that thing with the baby. I can't have her dividing her time between me and whatever tomfoolery pops into her pretty little head. Priorities, you know what I mean? <laughs> I see. So you've never met anyone named Don? Child or adult? Sure, I know a guy named Don. Play golf with him every couple weeks. Owns a place in Florida. Not Don, Don. D-A-W-N. It's a girl's name. A girl? No, I don't know any girl named Dawn. Okay. This might be a long shot, but I found an appointment book with 2.15 written on today's date. You don't have a meeting at that time, do you? 2.15 today? Not a chance. By 2.15, I'm at the pickled pepper in Stromboli. Happy hour. In fact, I should be on my way there pretty soon. Peter Piper and I go way back. Picked a few pecks of perky parties at the pickled pepper in my day. <laughs> Uh, sorry to eat and run. Uh, you've got the check, right? Right. I'd say thanks for your help, but you really haven't been much. Looks like I'll need to find out if this Dawn is a fraud on my own. And whatever her treasure might be. Did you say treasure? Uh, perhaps I can spare a few more minutes. What kind of treasure are we talking about? That got your attention. Too bad I don't know much more about it than you do. How can you know less than me? I don't know anything about a treasure. And I just heard about it. What a coincidence! Me too, just this morning. Don told Aurora that she had some kind of precious thing to share with her. We searched her room, but no sign of it. Does the address 59 Briar Road mean anything to you? 59 Briar Road? Never been there myself. That would be in the Stromboli area, wouldn't it? Old district. My firm has been doing a lot of development there over the years. Anyway, I should go. I have to meet... someone. Peter Piper. Oh, right. Yes. Uh, anyway, uh, farewell and all that. I took a moment to enjoy the sight of Philip leaving. But only a moment. Then I got up to follow him. I didn't for one second think that he was going to see Peter Piper. I wasn't sure who he was going to see. But I had a few hours until 2.15 and he was acting mighty suspicious. Or maybe he was really just that stupid. I threw down four bits on the table and snagged a fresh cookie as I hit the door. I stepped out of the doorway, a bibbidi-bobbidi brew, and looked up the street in the direction Philip had turned. I could see his tall, fair head as he walked north up Hey Diddle Diddle Boulevard, towards Stromboli. Maybe I was wrong. Maybe he was going to the pickled pepper. I set out after him, dodging traffic. Hey, I'm walking here! Get a horse, why don't ya? I passed the courtyard of Wee Willy Winky Plaza, where I almost got brained by a brick a couple of months ago. Up ahead, Philip crossed Contrary Street and things started to get kooky. He turned around and headed straight towards me. Had he made me? I turned to face a shop window, keeping my head down and reaching into my coat pocket as if I was fishing something out, my heart beating fast. I was praying he wouldn't notice me before he walked by. Hey, wait up! I froze, expecting him to grab my shoulder and start questioning me. Taxi! You there, cabbie! I sagged with relief. He was only hailing a cab. In the reflection of the store window, I watched him climb into a cab and speed off down the street. I ran to the next car in the cab rank and jumped inside. Driver, follow that cab! Where to, ma'am? Just follow the cab in front of you, the one that's driving down the street. But I don't know where he's uh, going. Do you have an address? I don't know where he's going either. That's why I need you to follow him. Now! Oh, I get it. Hold on to your cell. But I don't have a... Whoa! Once he got going, this cabbie knew how to put the pedal to the metal. Certainly not what you'd expect from a tortoise. I hung onto the armrest as we careened through the streets of Fairy Tale City. What are you following him for? I want to see where he goes. <laughs> I guess that makes sense. Just focus on the road, will you? You drive pretty fast for a tortoise, but that guy is even faster. Not always. I've raced him before. You mean the other driver's a hare? That's right. You've heard the story? Sure, sure. Look, he just turned up Stromboli. Now you can really open her up. Forget about slow and steady. Let's catch him. <laughs>
Crawl down the window, if you please. Sorry, uh, officer, what's the uh, problem? You are breaking the speed limit. That is the problem. Not to mention driving recklessly. Step out of the car, now. Oh, man, not again. Crumpet and croissant. I might have known. Madam Betsy, fancy meeting you here. Taking a cab uptown, are we? Ooh, fancy. Look, this is Prince's business, if you must know. I was on a job, and you just made me lose a tail. Oh, a thousand pardons, your ladyship. But speeding is still against the law. We are very sorry, Madam Betsy, but this driver must be penalized. Oh, no. I'll lose my license if I get uh, another ticket. Well, butter boy, you've got to learn to slow down. This isn't really his fault. I was the one who told him to speed up. So you want us to give you a ticket instead of him? Sorry, doesn't work that way. Sure it doesn't. And the next time I see the prince, I'll mention that we lost a suspect because of you, crumpet. You won't mind pounding a beat again for a few weeks, will you? Uh, she has a point, uh, Crumpet. Remember when the wolf escaped? Ugh. Fine. I'll let you off with a warning this time. But watch yourself in the future. Next time, I'm throwing the book at you. You bet, officer. I'll keep my uh, nose clean from here on. Slow and steady is my motto. Right. Come on, croissant. We're off. Au revoir, Madame Petit. You too, croissant. Thanks, tortoise. What do I owe you? You just got me out of a speeding ticket. Let's call it even. And call me Mark. Gee, thanks, Mark. Is that because you're a Mark turtle? No. It's short for Mark Speed. Right. Now I gotta figure out how to catch that tail I lost. Is there a payphone around here somewhere? I, uh, think so. Over by the park, there. The park? That gives me an idea. I'll catch you later. Any time. I like a little excitement now and then. I walked across to the park and started to whistle. Pretty soon, I heard a familiar voice. Hey, Betsy. What's buzzing, cousin? Roscoe, I was hoping to see you. Where are Stan and Avery? Busy gathering nuts for the winter. Sure, that makes sense. Well, I guess you'll have to do. Oh, I get it. When your real friends can't help you, you'll lower yourself to work with old Roscoe. That's not what I meant, and you know it. It's just easy to tail someone with three instead of one. Especially if one of the three can fly. Hey, I can tail with the best of them. Who do you need tailed? I'll follow him to heck and back. It's a prince, as a matter of fact. A prince? Oh boy, I love following rich guys. They go to fancy restaurants where the waiters drop food. Maybe not this time, but you can always hope. I lost him somewhere in Stromboli. I think he's headed to Briar Road. He's a tall, blonde guy, name of Philip. Prince Philip? I know him. Kinda. Real estate guy. Used to throw swanky parties with those horse duvets all over the place. I think you mean hors d'oeuvre, but that's the guy. Nah, right. I'll find him for you in a jiffy. Just keep up with me. I chased after Roscoe as he scampered through the streets of Stromboli, a working-class neighborhood of Fairy Tale City. The area had great restaurants, which was why Roscoe knew his way around so well. Eventually, we found Briar Road, where Roscoe climbed up a lamp pole. I see him. He's a block south heading away from us. Come on, let's catch him. The little raccoon moved fast. His small size let him squirm through the crowd a lot more easily than I could. After a short chase, I could see Philip crossing the road to an old bus station. Roscoe and I stopped at the door and peeked through. I didn't want Philip to recognize me, and a raccoon in a bus station would cause more problems than we were ready for right now. He's heading to the phone bank. Looks like he's making a call. Yeah. If only we knew what he was saying and who he was saying it to. You can tell a lot from body language. Notice how he's looking around while he talks? That means he's saying something secret that he doesn't want anyone else to hear. Good call. And that sly, greedy look on his face probably means it's about money. Like maybe a treasure. He has a treasure? No, at least not yet. I told him about one. You holding out on me? I want a part of any treasure you got. I haven't got it. Nobody does. So far. 
An old dame told Aurora that she had a precious treasure she wanted to share. We're trying to figure out what it is now. Well, you ain't gonna find out from him. Not with us stuck out here. That's a word from the bird. But I do know one thing. What's that? He has someone to call when he gets information. I'll figure out exactly who it is later. Thanks for your help, Roscoe. Here's your usual payment. An oatmeal raisin cookie. She thanks, Betsy. You're the best. He scampered off, muttering about saving cookies for the winner. I decided to head up Briar Road to find number 59. I hiked the five or six blocks south to number 59. The character of the buildings changed as I walked, from older businesses to more residential apartments and tenements. Still old, just not businesses. I stopped in front of an old shoe with about a million kids playing in the courtyard. Just as I stepped up to knock on the door, three large guys braced me. Hi there, little lady. Nice day, ain't it? So far. I've seen nicer. You should be careful around here. It's a rough neighborhood. Sure, and it's getting rougher by the second. You never know when something bad might happen, if you get my drift. Oh, I think I know, but uh, thanks for the tip, boys. What are you three doing here? Well, ask the questions, Missy. What are you doing here? I asked you first. We've been sent here to meet a certain person. Shut up, Baker! We ain't gonna tell her nothing. You mean like giving away our names? That would be bad. Exactly, candlestick maker. We don't want to let that sort of thing slip. You don't need to worry about that. I know just who you are. You do? Gosh darn it, our cover's blown already. How in tarnation did that happen? Don't feel bad. You're the butcher, you're the baker, and you must be the candlestick maker. Everyone knows the three men in a tub. They do? Oh, we wanted to keep a low profile. Too bad you're such good thugs. That kind of reputation is hard to keep under wraps. So what brings you here this afternoon? Doing some work for the old woman who lives in that shoe? Not at all. We aren't babysitters. We're thugs. We're here to threaten someone. Are you now? Anyone I know? Could be, could be. Do you know a Betsy Hardup? Never heard of her. But what does she do? She's a dick! Hey, now, that's uncalled for. I'm sure that she's a very nice person. He means she's a detective, a snoop, who goes around sticking her nose where it doesn't belong. That kind of thing could get a person hurt. If I see her, I'll be sure to let her know. Uh, whoever she is. Now wait just a cotton picking minute. You're Betsy Hardup, ain't ya? What? Why would you say that? I told you, I don't even know her. You fit the description to a T. I do? I have it right here. Short, with blonde hair tied at the back, wearing a shabby old trench coat, a battered fedora, and a smug expression. Let's see, let's see. Trench coat? Yes. Hat? Yes. Expression almost certainly. That's you, all right. You got the wrong gal. I ain't a dick, I tell you. I got proof. Okay, let's see it. I reached into my pocket for a secret weapon I kept just for situations like this. My wallet. I showed them my ID. Well, that's her, all right. But look at the name. Who's Ella Charming? That would be me. That ain't who we're after. It was my ID. Just not my current ID. The name seems familiar. Don't feel bad, boys. Everyone makes mistakes. Concerned? Now what are we going to tell the Dawn? That lit up my tilt sign. Did these guys know Dawn? Did she send them here to brace me? Maybe rough me up? Looks like Aurora was right. This is a setup. Good thing they were a few gallons short of a bath. I had to keep them talking. You know, I heard that Dawn was dead. Now where in the Sam Hill did you hear that? She was just fine when I talked to her this morning. This morning? Oh, really? And what did she tell you? You seem to have forgotten that we are asking the questions here. Well, maybe I got a few questions of my own. We don't have time for your questions, Miss Charming. 
Just consider yourself lucky that you aren't Betsy Hardup. If you do, sir, tell her to back off this treasure hunt. Sure, sure. What if she doesn't want to back off? I mean, hypothetically. Then she might just end up getting hurt. Badly. Or even dead. Badly. Badly dead? You boys mean business. I'll pass on the message, if I see her, whoever she is. Time for you to hit the trail, little lady. I tried to be cool as I walked up the street back towards my office. When I looked back to check on them, they had all disappeared. Probably around the corner waiting for the real Betsy Hardup to show up. Still, one thing was bothering me. What was that crack about a shabby old trench coat? Back in my office, I put my feet up on my desk and gazed out the window, thinking about my meeting with the three men in a tub. I knew they were local tough guys for hire. I knew that because they had a reputation that traveled, even if they didn't. So who had hired them? And they had mentioned Dawn. Only this Dawn was alive. Was it the same Dawn as Aurora's Dawn? If so, then she had some shady connections. Aside from Philip and the three men, I only had three clues. A notebook containing the numbers 215 and an address 59 Briar Road. And a key. No idea what it opened or where it came from. Not a lot to go on. I figured I'd do what I usually do when I don't know what to do. Go ask questions. And the person I would ask was whoever lived in that shoe at 59 Briar Road. Hello? Aurora, are you calling from the shop? How are you holding up? You know, with Dawn passing away and everything. Sure, sure, I won't quit now. Besides, I want to know what's going on here as well. You want to help? Are you sure? You know, sometimes these things get dangerous. I don't know how safe you'll be. Okay, okay. I guess I sound a bit like Ivan when he's trying to keep me out of trouble. If you want in, you got it. Next, we go see whoever lives at 59 Briar Road and see why that address was in Don's notebook. I'll come by your place. See you in 15. Aurora had a place over top of her apothecary shop, which made the commute pretty easy, I guess. I climbed the stairs to the door, thinking that we need to make some kind of a plan to distract the three men in the tub if they were still hanging around 59 Briar Road when we got back there. Maybe Aurora had some ideas or potions that could help. With any luck, they'll have just moved on since Betsy never showed up for her meeting. As I reached the top step, I noticed something shiny in the stairway. It was broken glass. I could see that Aurora's back window had been smashed and the door was hanging open. I raced inside, calling a name. Rory? Rory! Rory, are you okay? Looked like I wasn't going to get any help from Aurora, potions or otherwise. She was gone. This is a terrible development. What happened to Aurora? Who hired the three men in the tub? Will Betsy find Aurora? Will both of them find the treasure? Is Dawn really Aurora's daughter? So many questions. To find the answers, make sure you tune in to the next episode of the Fairy Tale Mysteries Radio Show, A Rude Awakening Part 2. A Rude Awakening Part 1 was performed by Franny Rorwick as Betsy Hardup, Omini Elias as Dawn, Melanie Mercer as Aurora, Alex Balzer as Print Phillip, Samantha Andrews as Officer Crumpet and the Candlestick Maker, Jeff Christensen as Officer Croissant and the Baker, Rochelle Beaulieu as Nurse Piglet, Drew Hart as Mac the Tortoise, Ruby Day as Roscoe Raccoon, Adrian Duncan as the Butcher. Hello, I'm your announcer, Christopher Hall. A Rude Awakening Part 1 was written by Alex and Mike Balzer. Continuity by Hannah Christensen. Directed by Mike Balzer. Music by Timothy Tucker. Vocals by Chelsea Rose. Sound effects and folly by Chris Cutress. 
Costumes? Yes, we do have costumes in radio, and they are by our dream team, Judy Sipson, Linda O'Donovan, and Chris Roberts. The Fairy Tale Mysteries Radio Show is produced by James T. Nelson and is a COVID fun project from Fraser Valley Musical Theatre. This season of the Fairy Tale Mysteries Radio Show has been made possible by the generous financial support of Metro Vancouver and the in kind support from the City of Delta. Thank you. All rights reserved. If you want a huge selection of audio drama, some of the newest ones out there as they come out, then do find Sunday Showcase on the Mutual Audio Network, which is the new home of the Sonic Society, the world's longest-running, largest showcase of modern audio drama. You can find us on the Sunday Showcase feed, or if you want to hear all of the day's worth of audio, then you can find it on the main Mutual Audio Network feed, wherever you get your podcasts. The Mutual Audio Network. Listening and imagining together.